Welcome to this series of supply chain lectures. I'm Johannes Vermorel, and today I will be presenting retail stock allocation with probabilistic forecast. In retail, stock allocation is a simple yet fundamental challenge. When and how much stock do you decide to move at any point of time between the distribution centers and the stores you operate? The decision moving stock depends on the future demand. Thus, um, forecast, the demand forecast of some kind is needed. However, this is retail. Demand at the store level is sparse. Thus, the, the um, uh, uncertainty of the future demand is irreducible. We need a forecast that properly reflects this unreducible uncertainty of the future. Thus, a probabilistic forecast is needed. Yet, um, making the most of a uh, probabilistic forecast uh, in order to optimize the supply chain decision is a non-trivial um, task. It would be tempting to recycle an existing uh, inventory technique uh, that has been originally designed with um, classic deterministic forecast in mind. However, doing so would uh, defeat the very reason why we did uh, introduce probabilistic forecast in the first place. The goal of this lecture is um, precisely to learn how to make the most of probabilistic forecasts in their native form to optimize a supply chain decision. As a first example, we will be considering the retail stock allocation problem. And um, through uh, the examination of this problem, we will see how we can actually optimize the stock level at the store level, but we'll see that also through um, the exploitation of those probabilistic forecasts, we can even uh, address entire new classes of supply chain problems, such as, for example, smoothing the flow of inventory from the distribution centers to the store in order to optimize and reduce the operating cost of the network. This lecture opens the sixth chapter of this series. This chapter is dedicated to um, decision making <coughs> techniques and processes in a supply chain context. We will see that decisions must be optimized uh, with the um, supply chain in mind, the whole supply chain network, the integrated system, as opposed to performing a series of isolated local optimization, for example, taking a narrow perspective of the skew. The first step to tackle supply chain decisions is to identify actual supply chain decisions. A supply chain decision has a direct, physical, tangible impact on um, the supply chain. For example, moving stock, uh, moving one unit of stock from um, the distribution center to a store is real. Uh, as soon as you do that, uh, there is one extra unit on the shelves of the store, and uh, there is one unit that is uh, now missing from the distribution center and that cannot be reallocated uh, anywhere else. Um, on the contrary, an artifact has no direct, uh, no such direct physical, tangible impact on the supply chain. An artifact is typically either an intermediate uh, calculation step that you have, which ultimately leads to a supply chain decision, or it is a statistical estimate of some kind that characterize a property of a part of your supply chain system. Unfortunately, I can't help but observe um, uh, a great deal of confusion in the supply chain literature uh, when it comes to distinguishing um, decisions from um, artifacts. Beware, returns on investments are exclusively obtained through uh, the improvement of the decisions. I mean, um, improving artifacts is, I mean, almost always quite inconsequential. Uh, and that is, you know, at best. And at worst, um, if the company spend too much time improving artifacts, th this becomes a distraction that actually prevents uh, the company to actually improve its actual supply chain decisions. On the screen, a list of confusions that I frequently observed in uh, mainstream supply chain circles. Um, for example, let's start with the safety stock. So the safety stock is not real. Um, you don't have two stocks, the safety stock and the working stock. There is only one stock, and the only decision that can be 
taken is do I need more or not? Uh, so, so moving, uh, reordering a quantity is real, the safety stock is not. Um, similarly, the service level isn't real either. Um, the, it's the service level is very much model dependent. Indeed, in retail, um, demand is uh, sparse, sales data are sparse. Thus, uh, if you take any given SKU, um, you typically have too little data to actually compute a, serv a meaningful service level by just inspecting the SKU. So the, the way you approach service level is through modeling techniques and statistical estimates, uh, which are fine. But again, this is an artifact. This is not the reality. This is literally a mathematical perspective that you have on your um, supply chain. Similarly, push or pull is also a matter of perspective. Uh, a proper numerical recipe that should operate at um, uh, taking into account the whole supply chain network is only going to consider the opportunity of moving one unit of stock from one origin toward uh, a destination. The fact that, uh, so what is real is um, the stock movement. Uh, what is just a matter of perspective is that do you want to trigger the stock movement based on the condition that is related to um, the origin or to the destination, you know, that we define per or pool. But uh, I would say this is at best, this is, uh, uh, I would say, a minor technicalities uh, of the numerical recipe. This is not something that is, you know, that represents the core reality of your supply chain. Um, conversely, you know, similarly, sorry, uh, dead stock is essentially uh, uh, a sort of estimate that you have on um, the stock that is at risk of, uh, of suffering an inventory write-off in a near future. This is what dead stock mean. From the eyes of a client, you know, there is no such thing as dead stock and stock that is alive. You know, both are products that may not be equally attractive, but uh, it is not something that is in the eye of the client or in the eye of the market. This is just um, a certain risk assessment that you make about your stock. It is fine, but this should not be confused with the inventory write-off, which is pretty much final, and that will really say that um, value has been lost. Um, similarly, the downward trend is also uh, a mathematical ingredient that can exist in the way you model the demand that you observe. Uh, it's typically going to be um, a time-dependent time factor that's introduced in the, uh, in the demand model. It's going to be like a linear, um, dependency to the time or maybe an exponential dependency to the time. But again, it is not the reality. The reality is maybe your business is decreasing due to the fact that you're losing clients. So um, churn clients is among other or other possibilities is, I would say, the reality of the supply chain. The downward trend is literally an artifact that you can use to kind of aggregate the pattern. And um, similarly, you know, there is, the list is quite long. Um, no supplier will sell you anything at the average buy price. Uh, the only reality is that you pick, you, you, you compose a purchase order, you pick quantities, and depending on the quantities you've picked, you will basically be able to leverage, if there exist, price breaks that your suppliers may offer. And um, you will get um, purchase prices based on those uh, price breaks and whatever you negotiate on top of that. That is the reality. The average uh, buy price is not real. So beware on, uh, on not making mistakes, you know, taking those um, numerical artifacts as if they, were, they had some kind of uh, fundamental um, uh, truth element to, to them. A and lastly, uh, ABC, the ABC classification, you know, that range from uh, top sellers to slow movers, is just a trivial volume-driven classification uh, of the SKUs or of the products that you have. Um, those classes are not real attributes. I mean, uh, we typically, uh, products, half of the products will change from one class, one ABC class to the next, from one quarter to the next. And yet, nothing really happened in the eyes of the clients or uh, in the eyes of the market for those products. So it's, it's, it's just a, a, a numerical artifact that has been applied to the product, and that should not be confused with a sort of profoundly uh, relevant attributes such as, for example, is this product part of my distributor brand? This is a true fundamental attribute uh, of, of the product that has, um, I would say, far-reaching consequences for my supply chain. 
And in this chapter, it should become increasingly clear why uh, it is imperative to focus on supply chain decisions as opposed to, I would say, waste time and focus dealing with um, uh, numerical artifacts. When the word optimization is pronounced, um, the usual perspective that comes to the mind, or at least that comes to the mind to a fairly educated audience, is um, the mathematical optimization perspective. Uh, given a set of variables, given a loss function, um, let's identify the viable values that minimize the loss function. This is literally the definition of the mathematical optimization perspective. Unfortunately, this approach works poorly in supply chain uh, because it assumes that the relevant variables are known. This is usually not the case, and even when it is the case, there are plenty of variables, let's say weather data, that are known to have an impact on your supply chain, but um, that comes with uh, a lot of cost if you want to actually acquire this data. And thus, it's not, um, it's not clear that it's actually worth um, the effort to actually acquire this data um, to optimize your supply chain. Even more troublesome, the loss function itself is largely unknown. Um, the loss function can be estimated somehow, but only the confrontation of the lost with um, the real world uh, feedback that you can obtain from your supply chain will give you true uh, uh, valid information about the adequacy of this loss function. You see, this is not a matter of correctness, or I would say uh, from a mathematical perspective, it is a matter of adequacy. Does this loss function, which is a mathematical construct, is adequate to reflect what I'm trying to optimize for my supply chain. We did address this conundrum of performing an optimization while we don't know the variables and we don't know the loss function in the lecture 2.2 titled Experimental Optimization. The experimental optimization perspective state that the problem is not a given. The problem must be discovered through repeated iterated experiments. The proof of correctness of the loss function and its variables emerge uh, not as a mathematical property, but uh, through a series of, um, of observations that are driven by uh, well-chosen experiments obtained from the supply chain itself. Um, experimental optimization profoundly challenge um, the way we look at optimization. And this is a perspective that I will be adopting in this chapter. The tools and techniques uh, that I will be introducing here are geared toward the experimental optimization perspective. At any point of time, the numerical recipe that we have can be declared obsolete, that's fine, and it can be replaced by an alternative uh, numerical recipe that is deemed to be more closely aligned with um, the supply chain that we have. And thus, at any point of time, we should be able to be able to, um, uh, to put what we have, the numerical recipe that we have identified, into production and perform the um, optimization process at scale. That means that, for example, we cannot say we identify the loss function and then we put a team of data scientists on the case for three months so that they can engineer some kind of, um, uh, I would say, um, software optimization techniques. No, no. It means that whenever we have a new uh, recipe, we should be able to directly put that in production and, dr uh, and immediately uh, let um, the, um, the supply chain decision benefit for, from this newly identified form of the problem. This lecture is part of a series of supply chain lectures. I'm trying to keep those lectures somewhat independent, but we are past the point where it makes, uh, where it makes more sense uh, to watch those lectures in, I would say, in sequence. So if you've not watched the previous, the previous lectures, it should be okay. But um, now at this point, uh, uh, it is probably, it will probably, this whole series will probably make more sense if you actually watch uh, the series in, uh, in the order it, is, it was presented. So this lecture is the first uh, lecture of the, uh, of the sixth chapter. In the first chapter, I presented my views on supply chain, both as a field of study and as a practice. In the second chapter, I presented a series of methodologies that are essential to, take, um, uh, to tackle supply chain challenges, including experimental optimization that we have just seen. And uh, those 
methodologies are needed because um, of the adversarial nature of most of the supply chain problems. In the third chapter, I presented a series of supply chain personae. So the third chapter is really a complete focus on the problems as opposed to the solutions. It's really what is it truly that we are trying to solve. Um, and don't confuse essentially the way you look at the problem and the sort of solution that ha you happen to have at the moment. In the fourth uh, chapter, I presented a series of fields that are not exactly um, supply chain per se. Those are the auxiliary sciences of supply chain. And yet, those auxiliary sciences uh, are essential to a modern practice of supply chain, just like having, uh, I would say, an entry-level knowledge of chemistry is essential to a modern practice of medicine. In the fifth chapter, I presented a series of predictive modeling techniques, most notably probabilistic forecast, which are essential to cope with the irreducible um, uncertainty of the future. And today, in this first lecture of the sixth chapter, we delve into decision-making techniques. Uh, the scientific literature has delivered over the last seven decades or so an overabundance of um, decision-making uh, techniques and algorithms from essentially dynamic programming right in the uh, 50s um, to reinforcement learning and even, and even possibly um, deep reinforcement learning. The challenge, however, is to achieve uh, production-grade supply chain results. Indeed, most of those techniques suffer from hidden flows uh, that make them somehow impractical for supply chain purposes from one reason to another. And today, we focus on retail stock allocation as the archetype of a supply chain, um, of a supply chain decision. This lectures is paving the way for more complex decisions and more complex situations. On the screen, um, the summary for today's lecture, uh, even when considering the simplest supply chain problem, uh, the retail stock allocation, we have quite a lot of grounds to cover. Those elements represent building blocks um, uh, for more complex situation. I will start by revisiting the manifesto of quantitative supply chain. Um, then I will clarify what I mean by um, retail stock allocation problem. To, uh, the also, the economic forces that are present in this problem will be reviewed. I will revisit the notion of probabilistic forecast and how we actually represent them, or at least one of the options to represent them. And we will see how to model the decision by reifying. So we reify on um, the forecast, but we will also reify the options. Um, that is the candidate potential decisions. Uh, the decision in the final product, the decision are uh, the things that are you know, on the table. And, uh, and then we introduce the stock reward function. Um, this function can be seen as a minimal framework to essentially convert a probabilistic forecast into uh, an economic score that can be associated to every stock allocation option. And obviously this takes into account a series of economic factors. Um, once the options are scored, we can proceed with a priority list. So a priority list is deceptively simple, but uh, it proved to be incredibly powerful and practical uh, in, I would say, real-world supply chains, um, both in terms of numerical uh, stability and in terms of also white-boxing characteristics. So um, white-boxing being the fact that you don't want your numerical recipes to be opaque. You want them to act like a white box where you can see through them, debug them, understand them. With a priority list, we solve um, uh, one problem for free, almost for free, and namely, we can smooth the flow of inventory from the distribution center to um, the stores uh, in order to reduce the operating, star, the operating cost of, uh, of the, the distribution center. And finally, we survey, we'll just briefly survey the action reward function, which is, uh, which nowadays supersede the um, stock reward function uh, at LOCAD in virtually every dimension except um, simplicity. 
The manifesto of uh, the quantitative supply chain is the document that I did originally published uh, back in 2017. This perspective uh, has been extensively covered in the lecture 1.2, uh, but for the sake of clarity, I will provide a tiny recap today. So there are five pillars, but only the first three are relevant, uh, are of interest for us today. The first three pillars are first consider all the possible futures, uh, which means technically speaking, probabilistic forecast, but also forecasting all the other elements that comes with an, uh, with an aspect of uncertainty. Um, that can be, for example, varying lead times that, that needs to be estimated or uh, future prices. Um, the second pillar is consider all the, fi the, the feasible decisions, and it's literally a reality principle. Focus on decisions, not artifacts, and we have, this is exactly what we have just um, detail a few minutes ago when, uh, when clarifying what is a decision and what is an artifact. And lastly, the third, the third point is prioritize with economic drivers, um, which is exactly the topic of today's lecture. And in particular, we will see how we can actually convert probabilistic forecasts into estimates uh, of economic returns. In the retail stock allocation uh, problem, um, this is the definition that I'm giving. It is somewhat arbitrary, but this is the definition that I will be using uh, today. We assume a network with two echelons. Uh, we have um, a distribution center and we have multiple stores. The distribution center is serving all the stores. Um, and obviously, if you have multiple distribution centers, we are just assuming that essentially one store is only served by only a single distribution center. Um, the goal is to properly allocate the stock that exists in the distribution center into the stores. And all the stores compete for the same stock that exists in the distribution center. We assume that all store can be replenished on a daily basis uh, with a daily schedule from um, the, dis uh, the distribution center. Thus, every single day, we must decide uh, how many units to move for every single product uh, toward each store. And the total quantity of units that are moved cannot exceed um, what is actually in stock in the distribution center. And it is also reasonable to expect that um, there are um, store shelf capacity limits as well. If the distribution center was having unlimited stocks, then um, the problem would actually devolve into a single echelon supply chain. Uh, indeed, um, there, would, there would never be any need to do any kind of arbitrage or trade-off uh, between allocating the stock to a store or another store. So the, the two echelon property of the network only emerged due to the fact that the stores compete for the same stock. And um, naturally, we will assume visibility on the store sales. We'll assume visibility on um, the stock levels, both at the distribution center uh, level and at the store level. Uh, and when I say we assume visibility, I mean we assume that the data, the transactional data uh, is available. We'll also assume that the uh, incoming deliveries to be made at the uh, distribution center uh, are, um, are known with, um, uh, with, estimate, with uh, ETAs, you know, estimated time of uh, arrival, which may come with um, some degree of uncertainty. And we also assume that all the mundane but critical information is available, such as the product buy price, the product sell price, uh, the product categories, if any, et cetera, et cetera. So nothing, nothing out of the, or, or of the ordinary, all of those information would be found in any ERP, even you know, 30, 30, three decades old ERP and WMS and point of sale system pretty much already had this data. They don't necessarily had at the time uh, 10 years worth of history, but, uh, but nowadays, nowadays um, they do. Um, so, uh, I mean, at least if it was, uh, if, uh, if they had the time to acquire such a depth of history. So today we do not include the, uh, um, uh, the DC replenishment as part of the problem. In practice, um, uh, distribution center replenishment and store allocations are tightly coupled, however. Um, so it really makes sense to um, address those problems together. Uh, the reason why I'm not doing that today is that for the sake of clarity and concision, in this lecture, we will tackle the, 
simpler problem first. Um, however, please note that the approach that I'm presenting today can uh, be naturally extended to uh, include the um, DC replenishment as well. Deciding to, um, um, to move plus one unit of stock into a, sto uh, a store for a given product at a given day um, is, depends on a series of economic forces. If moving the unit is profitable, we want to do it. Otherwise, we don't. Um, the main economic forces are listed on the screen. And essentially, putting more stock in a store results in a series of benefits, which are essentially more gross margin, just because you avoid lost sales. You also have a better quality of service, just again, because you reduce the amount of stockouts. And you also improve the store attractiveness. Indeed, for a store um, to be attractive needs to be plentiful. Uh, otherwise, you know, it looks sad and people don't have the same willingness to buy if the, uh, if the store doesn't feel really plenty. Uh, at least it is a very common observation made in retail. Uh, this not, doesn't necessarily apply to all the segments. For example, I would not necessarily have this sort of consideration applied to um, hard luxury. But let's say if we are, doing, we are looking at a general, a general merchandise store or a fashion store, this, will, uh, this sort of consideration will apply. And so, but, but unfortunately, uh, putting more stocks also comes with drawbacks. So economic forces that are diminishing the returns that we could expect from putting more stock in the store. Um, we have extra carrying costs, uh, which can turn into inventory write-off if we have really a true excess of stock. Then we can also have intake overload, which happens if um, the, the staff at the store cannot even process um, a shipment that is just too large. And so it, it, it creates a confusion and mess in the store if the quantity that is being delivered on any given day exceed what um, the, the staff of the store can actually put on the shelves. Um, and also we have an opportunity cost, which is whenever we put one unit uh, in a store, then it means that this unit cannot be put anymore into another store. I mean, it could be brought back to the distribution center and resent, but this is typically quite expensive. So for most retail situation, you, um, this is a last resort option. You really want to be able to do your store allocation uh, thinking that you won't have to move the store back. Uh, also, smoothing the flow of inventory is highly desirable. Indeed, um, an uh, NEDC has essentially a nominal capacity at which it operates at peak economic efficiency. Uh, and this is typically, uh, and this peak efficiency is basically driven by um, the physical setup of the DC, but also the amount of staff, uh, of permanent staff that is attached to the DC. And, and thus, ideally, the DC should operate on a daily basis um, or uh, should remain you know, operating very close to its nominal capacity in order to, um, uh, to be most cost efficient. However, uh, this requires, if we want to keep the DC operating at peak efficiency, this requires smoothing the flow uh, from the DC to the stores. And, um, and that's where I would say the economic perspective diverges from, um, I would say, the traditional service level oriented perspectives that you would see in, uh, in the mainstream supply chain literature. Uh, indeed, um, this is dollars of returns that we're seeking here, not percentage points. And the only way to decide if it's reasonable to basically um, adjust the um, uh, stock allocation scheme at the, at the network level to reduce the operating cost versus you know, a minor degradation of the quality of service that you would generate in the stores, the only way to arbitrage this trade-off uh, between quality of service and um, um, the, operating the operating cost of the distribution center is to adopt the economic perspective that I'm presenting today. Uh, if you adopt a service level perspective, literally it cannot give you this sort of answers. Thus, our goal is at this point, to establish the numerical recipes that will estimate the economic outcomes uh, for any given um, stock allocation decision. 
In the previous chapter, the fifth chapter, we have seen how to produce probabilistic forecast, and we have also introduced a specialized data type, uh, the RENVAR, which represents a one-dimensional discrete probability distributions. And um, I'm not going to repeat here the whole content of the lecture 5.2, uh, but let's just say in short uh, that a RENVAR is a specialized data type used to represent a probabilistic forecast, a simple one-dimensional probabilistic forecast in Envision. So Envision is a domain-specific programming language that has been engineered by LOCAD for the sole purpose of the predictive optimization of supply chains. So that's what I'm using those lectures. But as usual, there is nothing fundamentally unique about Envision in whatever I'm presenting in those lectures. Um, this is just a matter of presentation clarity and concision. Um, the numerical recipes that I'm describing today can be implemented in any language, um, Python, Julia, Visual Basic, uh, whatever. The key angle is that RENVAR provides a high performance uh, algebra of random variables. And performance is essentially here a balance between um, compute cost, memory cost, and the degree of numerical approximation that you're willing to tolerate. Indeed, um, compute performance is critical in, uh, when dealing with retail networks. Uh, there can be millions, if not tens, of millions of SKUs. Uh, and every single SKU is at least, like it, it's likely to have at least one probabilistic forecast, you know, one, one RENVAR. It can have a lot more, but at the very least, it will have one, uh, one probabilistic forecast. And thus, you may end up with literally millions or tens of millions of, uh, of histogram. And the key property of the RENVAR versus an histogram is to keep both CPU cost and memory cost upper bounded and as low as possible, obviously, but more importantly, upper bounded. So you have like a constant time for all the operation. Uh, and also you want to make sure that the numerical approximation that you introduce remain inconsequential from um, a supply chain perspective. So keep in mind that we are not doing, I would say, uh, um, I would say uh, scientific computing here. We are doing uh, supply chain computation. So if you have like an approximation of one part per billion, it is, from a supply chain perspective, inconsequential. This is not astronomy where you need to be able to, to be incredibly precise. Numerical calculation should be precise, but you don't need to have like, uh, I would say, insane precision. And thus, in the following, we assume that the probabilistic forecast will be provided under the guise of RENVARs, so that a series of variables uh, with a specific data type. Uh, in practice, you can replace RENVAR by histograms, and you get mostly the same outcome except for the performance and the convenience. Now that we have our probabilistic forecast, let's consider how we are going to approach the uh, decisions. Let's start by considering the options. So the options are the candidate potential decision. So for example, we can allocate zero unit for a given product to a given store on a given day. Uh, or we can allocate one, two, three units. All of those are our options. If we decide that we pick two, then this number, two units, becomes our decision. The options are all the, op are all the things that are on the table, you know, waiting to be decided. A simple way to organize those options consists of putting them in a list, which is exactly what I've done on the screen. Uh, and, and so the list displays is, is essentially covers multiple SKUs. So you would put this, it's going to be a very long list. You put all those SKUs in this list. And then for every single SKU, you add one line per option. Uh, each option represents a quantity to be allocated. So obviously, this quantity, you can do zero, allocate zero, one, two, three, till infinity. The reality is that you don't have to go to infinity. You can actually stop to the quantity that is in stock at the distribution center. That will be, give you an upper bound. But more realistically speaking, usually you have actually a, a bound that is even lower that is going to be you know, the maximal shelf uh, capacity that exists for the product on, on the store or something that is close to it. So you have, you have a, a, a list that has uh, essentially uh, every SKU is listed and for every SKU, you have all the quantities that are you know, possible, that can be possibly considered as candidate for, uh, for allocation uh, um, uh, from the distribution center. Now, 
the score column is attached to the marginal outcome that you would expect by doing this allocation. A well-designed score, so I've not said how this score is actually computed. I'm just saying that a well-designed score ensures that picking, uh, picking the lines in a decreasing score orders uh, optimize the economic outcome for the retail network. So you see, this is literally a definition of what we are seeking. A proper score should be such as if we pick the lines in decreasing orders, starting from the high score, we are doing what is best uh, for the retail network. This is what we are trying to design. Uh, and we will get to the fine print of the design of this, of the calculation of the, of the score in a minute. For the two SKUs uh, that we can see on the screen, we see that the score decrease, uh, decreases as the allocation increases. This um, illustrates the very dominant uh, phenomenon of the diminishing returns that are observed for most SKUs. So essentially, putting the first unit almost always generate more returns than um, the second one. So the, the first unit that you put in a store is almost always more profitable than the second one. You can just think of, uh, think of it. Uh, at first, you have nothing, so you're in a stockout situation. If you put one unit, you've already addressed the, uh, the, the stockout for the first client. And then uh, if you put a second unit, well, um, the first client will be fine, but it's only if there are two clients that show up that the second unit will be of any use. So uh, it has a, a smaller um, economic return. However, it is um, having strictly diminishing, so the, the, the returns are always roughly diminishing if we are looking you know, at, a, at, a, at a long list. However, locally, there are some exceptions where the, the, the economic returns might not be strictly diminishing from one line to the next. Um, I will let uh, it, the identification of such situation to, as an exercise to the audience. Uh, but more seriously, I will be revisiting the case uh, in, a, in a later lecture. So for today, we just stick to the simple situation where the, um, the, the costs are, uh, I would say the returns are strictly diminishing as you increase the stock. The other situations are kind of fringe. At LOCAD, uh, the, this representation where we have such a, a list where we can see all the SKUs and all the options is typically referred to as being a grid. So that's what we call a grid. And um, so that's the SKUs inflated by the list of options. And the intent is obviously to sort this grid by decreasing ROI, return on investment. And by the way, there is nothing wrong with those grids per se, except they, they are just like the histograms. I, um, and, uh, and the problem is that those grids, I mean, in tabular forms, are not very efficient, especially compute-wise or memory-wise. And they don't offer any kind of support beside the fact that it's actually a, a very large table. And keep in mind that we are talking of a retail network and that this grid might end up having a billion lines or so. And um, big data is fine. That's what you know, cloud computing is for. But in my experience, small data is better, or at least it's where uh, it creates much less friction and you're much more agile if you can actually turn your big data problem into a small data problem. So smaller data makes everything simpler in production. And that's what we want to try to do here. Thus, one of the solutions uh, adopted by LOCAD to deal with uh, a large number of options uh, is ZFUNX. So this is a data type, just like RENVAR's, and it's literally the counterpart of RENVAR, but from the decision perspective. So RENVAR's were the demand, all the possible futures, and the ZFUNX, it's about all the possible decisions. That's what it's about. And so instead of representing probabilities, like Renvars, a ZFUNC represents all the economic outcomes associated to a one-dimensional discrete series of uh, options, of discrete options. The ZFUNC is technically a function mapping uh, integers, you know, positive and negative to real values. That's what you can see. This is literally uh, the, the technical definition. But just like Renvars, uh, if there is mathematician in the audience, it would say it is not possible to represent any arbitrary function, um, any arbitrary complex function like ZFUNX with a finite amount of memory. Um, so there again, there is a trade-off to be made between precision 
and uh, resolution. Uh, and however, in supply chain, arbitrarily complex um, economic functions do not exist. Um, you can have fairly complex uh, cost, uh, I would say, economic functions, but they can't be arbitrarily complex. Um, and, uh, and so it is, all, it is, in practice, possible to compress the z funks under four kilobytes. So you have a data type that represents you know, your entire cost function, and you compress it so that it's always less than four kilobytes while keeping the degree of numerical approximation inconsequential from a supply chain perspective. So if you keep the numerical approximation so small that in practice it doesn't change the final decision that you're about to take, which is discrete, then um, the, uh, the, the, the appro numerical approximation can be said to be completely inconsequential because you end up doing the same thing in the end, even if you had uh, infinite precision. Now, why four kilobytes? Well, it is literally related to the uh, computing hardware. So we have seen that in one of the lecture about, uh, about um, uh, modern computing hardware for supply chain in, um, in the, the RAM, the random access memory that you have in a modern you know, computer, either your, your workstation, your notebook, or a computer in the cloud doesn't let you access your memory byte per byte. As soon as you touch the RAM, it's going to be four kilobyte uh, a segment of four kilobytes that is going to be retrieved. And thus, um, it, is, it is best if you can t keep the amount of data under four kilobytes because it will actually match the way um, the, the hardware is actually designed and exists uh, for, for your supply chain. The compression algorithm used by LOCAD for the Z-Funks differed from the one used for the RENVARs because we are not exactly addressing the same um, numerical problems. For RENVARs, we mostly care about preserving the mass of probabilities over contiguous segments. So that's what we're trying. We, we can look at any segments, and we want to preserve on those segments the mass of probabilities. Uh, for uh, a Z-Funk, this is different. We typically want to preserve the amount of variations that we observe from one position to the next, because that's typically with the variation from one position to the next that we can decide that is it the last profitable option or should we, should we stop? So, that's, so the focus is slightly different and thus the compression algorithm is different as well. And on the screen, you can see uh, a plot obtained for a Z-Funk re reflecting uh, some mock expected carrying costs that depends on the number of unity stocks. So this is just um, a, a representation. And essentially, Z-Funk benefit from being a vector space. So they can be added, subtracted. So it's just the, the classical uh, vector space associated to functions. Uh, and um, by essentially preserving memory locality, operation can be uh, performed with what is typically an order of magnitude faster compared to uh, a naive grid implementation uh, where you just have a very, very large table, but where there is not, I would say, a specific data structure to capture the locality of the options that are just playing together. Now on the screen, a few lines of code that are illustrating how um, dead funks are used. By the way, uh, what we, the, the plot that, was, uh, that you could see in the previous slides were actually generated by this script. Thus, at line one and two, we declare um, two linear functions, f and g. Uh, and by the way, the function linear is just part of the standard library. It's just uh, linear of one is just the identity function. That's a, uh, uh, that's a polynomial of degree one. And, uh, and, and linear returns um, a z-funk. And then uh, it is possible to add a constant to a z-funk. That's exactly what is happening here. And so we have two polynomial of degree one, f and, uh, and g. At, li at line three, we... Um, construct a second degree polynomial through the product of f and g. And the lines 5 to 10 are just utilities, essentially a boilerplate to plot the z-funk. And that was how we generate um, the, the plot that you could see in the previous slide. And uh, at this point, we have essentially our data container for um, the z-funk for our options and their economic outcomes. So the z-funk is a data container just like the RENVAR was data, so the, the Z-Funk is a data container for the economic outcomes, just like the RENVAR was a data container for the probabilistic forecast. Um, but we still need 
numerical recipes to compute those economic outcomes. So you see we have the data container, but I haven't described yet how do we even compute those economic outcomes and, uh, and fill in those Z funks. And thus, uh, the stock reward function is a small framework intended to compute the economic uh, returns for every stock level of a single skew considering a probabilistic forecast and a short series of economic factors. The stock reward function was historically introduced at LOCAD to unify our practices. You see, back in 2015, um, LOCAD had already been working for a couple of years with probabilistic forecast, and uh, through trials and error we had at the time already uncovered a series of numerical recipes that were um, working well, but they were not really unified, you know, it was a bit, uh, it was a, 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 a small mess. And so the stock reward function uh, did consolidate all those insights at the time into a clean, tidy, uh, minimalistic framework. Um, since 2015, uh, better methods have been developed, uh, but they are also more complex. So we will see those, but for the sake of, the cl of clarity, uh, it's still better to start with the stock reward function and, uh, and to present this function first. So um, the stock, so keep in mind that the stock reward function is really about uh, finding a numerical recipe that will give us uh, a calculation for the economic outcomes that are attached to those probabilistic forecasts. So the stock reward function obeys the equation that you can see on the screen and, uh, and it defines the economic returns at time t that you can obtain for the stock on hand k. So essentially, uh, R is literally the economic return. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's in terms of units, it is homogeneous to dollars. So essentially, stock reward function is expressed in dollars or euros, if you prefer. And uh, it has, it has, the function has two variables, which are the time t and the stock on hand. So, and we, what we want is to compute this reward for all the possible stock levels, obviously. Um, and there are four economic variables to be considered. M is the gross margin uh, per unit sold. So it's literally the margin, the gross margin that you will earn by successfully servicing one unit. That's the variable M. The variable S is um, the stock out penalty. That's essentially a sort of um, uh, virtual cost that you incur whenever you fail at servicing a unit to a client. Indeed, you see, uh, even if you don't have to pay a penalty to your client, there is a cost associated with failing to proper a uh, correct service to your clients. Thus, this cost must be modeled. And here we are talking, we are taking, um, uh, I would say the, one of the most simple way to model this cost is just to say that for every unit that you fail to serve, there is a penalty and it's called, uh, and it's named S. And then we have C, the carrying cost. So the carrying cost is just the cost per unit per period of time. So if you have one unit that you keep in stock for three periods, that will be three times C. If you have two units that you keep in stock for uh, three periods, that will be six times the value C. And alpha is used to discount the future returns. So um, the idea is that with the, the alpha is that uh, what happened in a distant futures master less than what is hab about to happen uh, uh, next day, so it's like a, the discounted perspective. So the stock reward function is essentially as simple as it can be without being downright simplistic. The equation indicates that if the demand exceeds the stock on hand, then we have a, a, a return um, that includes the margin for all the stock that we have, this is what the, the first line is saying. So, so we, have, we have K margin, so we, we sell all the, the units that we have. And then we incur uh, a penalty that's going to be Y of T minus K for all the units that we fail to serve. So that's essentially what the first line is saying. And otherwise, if uh, the stock on hand exceeds the demand, then uh, we, in, we can benefit of YT of, uh, times M which represent the margin of what we have sold today, and then we have to pay for the carrying cost. So the, the carrying cost for today is going to be what, what is left at the end of the day. So it's going to be K minus Y of T times C, the carrying cost, plus we have alpha times 
the stock reward function r star for uh, the next day. Uh, so there is, there is a gotcha with r star. So r star is almost identical to the, um, the stock reward function r, except that we just put the stock out penalty at zero. Um, the reason is very simple. We assume from the stock reward per perspective that we will have later opportunities to uh, fill in the stock. So if we observe um, a stock out today, it is too late. Um, so we, we, we do incur the stock out penalty. However, a stock out penalty that is deemed to occur in the future, you know, in a later period, we assume that replenishment can happen at every period and thus for the stock out that would happen at a later period, well, we still have the time to do, uh, I would say, a late reorder, if you want, and thus um, this stock out has not yet happened. So we still have the opportunity to do it, and that's why, um, that's why essentially we put the stock out penalty at zero, because the reality is that we anticipate that there will be, hopefully, another reorder that will prevent this stock out from happening. The time discount alpha is uh, very useful because it essentially uh, removes the need to specify a specific or time horizon. Um, the stock reward function doesn't work with a finite time horizon, you go till infinity. And, um, and essentially, thanks to alpha, that is a value that is strictly smaller than one, essentially the, va the, the, the economic outcomes that are attached to, um, to events that are in a very far, futures, very far future become uh, vanishingly small, so they, they become inconsequential, but we don't have any kind of cutoff, uh, which are always kind of, you know, uh, why, why would you cut your supply chain horizon to 60 days or uh, 90 days or one year or two years extra? So, so why, why would you pick a specific date where you cut off, where you cut your horizon? The discount approach is actually uh, numerically more stable, at least in, in my experience. In Envision, the stock reward function just take a renvar as input uh, and returns a zfunc. So the stock reward function is literally a, a small building block that is going to turn a renvar, so a, a probabilistic forecast, into a zfunc, which is literally a container for the estimated economic returns uh, on a series of options. And uh, the, the, stock the stock reward function, as the name suggest is literally the economic return associated to every single stock position. What happens if I have zero unit in stock, one unit in stock, two unit, three unit, etc., cetera, et cetera. That's what the stock reward function is about, and that's the, that, that is the economic outcomes that the Z-Funk will reflect. Thus, uh, and the Z-Funk encode, encode for every stock level the economic return associated to the corresponding stock level, and the process to actually compute those uh, z funks is illustrated on the screen that you can see. At line one, we introduced a mock demand for, uh, for a single day. So this is just, um, just a, a random a Poisson distribution. Uh, at line two to seven, we introduced the economic viables. And by the way, we have two alphas. Indeed, um, there is a, another gotcha, is that um, we have a ratchet effect on the inventory. Once the stock has been pushed toward a store, it is typically very expensive to bring the sto the, this stock back. Thus, uh, it reflects that essentially, uh, we should reflect that any allocation made to a store is pretty much final. Thus, in terms of carrying cost, um, the alpha should not be uh, too small uh, because essentially we will really incur those carrying costs. If we, if we overstock, we will have to incur this carrying stock. We cannot undo this decision. However, uh, when it comes to um, the alpha that is related to the margin, the reality is that just like we will have other opportunities to address uh, the stock outs, future stock outs, we will have other opportunities to bring more stock and just perform this, the very same margin with stock that is pushed at a later date. Thus, we, we need to discount uh, much more aggressively um, whatever happens on the margin side compared to what is happening on the carrying cost side. Um, so at line 9 to 11, we introduce uh, the stock reward function itself. And this 
function, the stock reward function that I've introduced, you know, the mathematical function that I've introduced in the previous slide, can be decomposed linearly in its three components, respectively addressing um, the margin, the carrying cost, and the stock out penalty separately. Indeed, the, uh, the we, we have like a linear separation. And those, um, and here in Envision, those three components are computed separately. And again, we have um, the algebra of uh, the, I would say the vector space of Z-Funks that is at play because we call the stock reward function and then we can multiply by, for example, uh, the air arm, we can multiply the Z-Funk by uh, buy price minus sell price. So essentially we are just multiplying the Z-Funk by uh, the factor M, which would be the gross margin. And, um, and then we at, uh, at, line, uh, from at the lines 13 to 15, the final reward is recomposed by adding the three economic components. In these scripts, we are again leveraging the fact that uh, we have a vector space of z funks So those z funks are not numbers, they are functions, but we can add them. And the result of the addition is another function, which is also a z funk And so the viable reward is the result of adding those three components together. Uh, and by the way, under the hood, the calculation of um, the stock reward function is done through, from a, a fixed, uh, through a fixed point analysis, which can be done in constant time for every component. And um, this constant time calculation might seem like a, 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 a very minor technicality, but when you're dealing with a large retail network, um, this really makes the difference between a fancy prototype and a, an actual production grade solution. Now, at this point, we have consolidated all the ingredients that we need to address the stock allocation problem. Uh, we have probabilistic forecast expressed as RENVAR. We have a technique to transform this RENVAR into a function giving economic returns for any stock on hand uh, value. Those economic um, uh, uh, outcomes can be conveniently represented as z -funks. Um And now, in order to finally address the stock allocation problem, we need to answer the question, the question. And the question is, if we can only move one single unit of stock, which one do we move? And by the way, why this one? Uh, indeed, all the stores in the network are competing for the same stock in the distribution center. Thus, the quality of, of the decision of moving one unit of stock from one store from, one, uh, from the distribution center to a specific store depends on the overall state of the network. You cannot assess whether this decision is, um, is, uh, is good by just looking at this one store. Just to give you an, uh, an example, let's assume that we have a store where we have already two units in stock and if we add a third unit, we are increasing the expected service level from 80% to 90%. So this is good. And maybe ma most retail network would say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with the idea of, uh, of bringing one extra unit so that my service level can go from 80% to 90%. That feels very reasonable. So they would say, this is a good move. However, what if this unit that we're about to move, this third unit, is actually the last one that is available in the distribution center? So it is the last. And we have another store on the network that is already suffering a stock out. And what happens is that if we move this unit, this, this unit into uh, this store where it becomes the third unit, what happens is that we even prolong the stock out for the store that is already out of stock for the very same product. So you see, in this sort of situation, it is almost you know, certain that moving the unit to the store that is already out of stock is a better decision. It is something that should take a higher priority. And that's why it doesn't make sense from, uh, I would say, an economic, to, to assess economically stock levels at the SKU level. You see, that's the problem with local optimizations. Local optimization don't work if you operate inside a system. You know, the, the, the main problem that you have in supply chain is that if you address the things locally, you just displace problems. You don't address anything. And thus, the adequacy of a stock level of a SKU is dependent on the state of the network. Um, and this simple uh, example clarify, for example, why the safety stock, 
the safety star calculation or the real other point calculation is mostly nonsense, at least for, except for maybe toy situation like the one that can be found in supply chain textbooks. Um, thus here, we really want to prioritize all the stock allocation against one another. And um, one option as um, the option that comes at the very top uh, is the answer to our question. This will be the one unit that should be moved if we can only move a single unit. Ranking stock allocation options is relatively straightforward uh, with the proper tools. Uh, let's review this Envision script. Uh, at line one, we create three SKUs named A, B, and C. At line two, we generate random buy prices between one and 10. This is just mock data. At line three, we generate mock Z funks that are supposed to represent the reward that we have for each of those SKUs. In practice, a Z funk should be computed with um, the stock reward function, but just to keep the code nice and concise, I'm just using mock data here. The reward is decreasing. This is just a linear function that decreases toward one, and it will hit zero at stock six. And, um, and, the, uh, and so uh, at line four, uh, I am creating a table G. G is a, short for, uh, is a shorthand for grid. This is the grid that represents all our um, stock and hand levels. We assume that the stock levels above 10 here are not worth assessing. Um, this assumption is reasonable considering that in terms of mock data, I have a, a, a reward function that becomes negative after the, beyond the stock position, the stock on hand of equal, to, uh, beyond the stock level of, of six. So 10 is relatively conservative here. And uh, at line six, we extract the marginal reward for the nth unit in stock so that we have this grid table and then the value at just you know take the function the, the so skews dot reward is a zen fog, so it's a function and we are just extracting the value for the stock position uh, g dot n and uh, and by the way this line starting from six it would not matter how the data is origin is originally uh, generated so what we have is from line one to four it is just mock data, so that would not be a production setup. But what you have starting from like line six, it would be essentially the same if you were in production. You know, there is now it's uh, it's applicable no matter how you came, how you did generate your your Z funks. Uh, at line seven, we define the score. This is an arbitrary decision as a ratio uh, between uh, the dollars of returns. Remember that the Z funk tells you the dollars of return that you have divided by the dollar invested, which is the, the buy price. So we make a ratio between the amount of dollars that you will get back divided by um, the amount of dollars that you have to pay for this one unit. And uh, essentially, the highest score is obtained for the stock allocation that generate the highest rate of return per dollar allocated to this store. Uh, and, uh, and finally, uh, at line 9 to 15, we display a table sorted by decreasing stores. Um, let's point out that there is um, no fancy logic in the script. So we have the first four lines are just mock data generation. The last six lines are just display of the prioritized allocation. Um, once the Zitfunks are uh, are, are present, um, and, and once we have Z-Funks that represent essentially economic returns per stock level, turning those Z-Funks into a prioritized list is completely straightforward. On the screen, um, the table obtained by running the previous Envision script. So we have the previous Envision script, and this is the, the, uh, the, so the dashboard that is generated by, for, by running the script. And we see that the SKU named C is ranked first. Indeed, all the SKUs have the same economic returns uh, this is, uh, due for their first unit, namely uh, $5 of return. And uh, however, C has the lowest buy price at 3.99. Uh, um, thus, as we divide the reward, 
five by three dot uh, ninety nine, we get a score of approximately one point twenty five, which happens to be the highest score of the grid. Uh, the second unit uh, of C has a score of, of ten. Uh, of, sorry, as a score of one, uh, of approximately one, which is the si second highest score as well. However, for the third position, we in the grid we have uh, another skew. We have the skew named B. Indeed, B has a higher buy price, and thus its score for the first unit is only at 0 0.96. However, due to the diminishing returns that we get of allocating the first two units on the skew C. Um, the first unit of B gets a higher score than the third unit of C, and thus it gets ranked above the first unit of C. Uh, and essentially, this priority list you know, goes very, very deep, but it is intended to be truncated with a threshold. Um, for example, we can decide that there is a minimal return on investment and only the units above this return on investments uh, gets allocated. And once the, the threshold is defined, we can take all the lines that are above the cutoff and count the number of lines per skew. And this gives us a total number of units to be allocated for every single given skew. Uh, we will revisit this cutoff problem uh, in a minute. But the idea is that um, once you have a cutoff, you aggregate per skew the counts, and that gives you the total quantity to be allocated for every single uh, skew, which is exactly what um, your WMS or your ERP that exists in the distribution center would expect to organize the next day shipment toward the stores. So the, the disparity list is just a conceptual view to actually decide what takes the priority. However, you take a cutoff, you aggregate, and then you're back to quantities per uh, uh, allocation quantity per skew for every single skew that exists in your uh, retail store network. The view on, um, that you have, so the display of the prioritized stock allocation is deceptively uh, simple and yet powerful. Um, as we go down from one line to the next, what we see is actually the competition unfold between our allocation options. Um, the best SKUs get uh, allocated first, but as soon as we reach higher stock levels, um, those SKUs become uncompetitive, less competitive compared to other SKUs that don't have yet as much stock. And so the, the, the priority list switches from one SKU to the next, depending on, you know, uh, every single time maximizing the expected returns on, uh, on capital being invested, being allocated to the stores. And, um, and on this screen, uh, we have a variant of the previous table. Uh, so this variant has been obtained with an, another Envision script that is just a very minor variant of the one that I introduced two slides ago. Essentially, uh, I am decomposing uh, the economic factors that contribute to the reward. I, um, here we have three extra columns that are margin, carrying cost, and stockout. And the margin is the expected average uh, gross margin for this one unit being allocated. The carrying cost is the expected average cost of putting this one unit in, um, in, the, 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 sto in the store. And the stockout is the expected penalty that is going to be avoided. So that's why it, the, the stockout penalty is actually a positive value here. It's because it is uh, the penalty that you avoid by putting one more unit. And the final reward is just the sum of those three uh, components. And all those values are uh, expressed in monetary amounts. So those are dollars. So the column, uh, the column that is margin, dollars, carrying cost, dollars again, stock out, dollars, and reward is just the total amount of dollars that you can expect uh, by putting this one unit uh, into the store. And that makes understanding and debugging this numerical recipe, the fact that we have dollars, vastly easier compared to percentages in practice. You see, um, indicators expressed in dollars are um, s uh, very much aligned with the white boxing philosophy that we recommend at LOCAD. Uh, indeed, 
any non-trivial numerical recipe is going to be fairly opaque by design. Um, you don't need deep learning to get deep opacity. Uh, even a modest linear regression is going to be plenty opaque as soon as you have a couple of factors that are involved in this regression. And this opacity that you get, again, with any non-trivial numerical recipe is uh, putting uh, real-world supply chains at risk. Uh, because supply chain practitioners get lost and confused and um, they can be distracted by um, uh, modeling technicalities. The prioritized list of allocation, which decompose the economic drivers, is a powerful audit tool. It uh, lets the supply chain practitioners directly challenge the fundamentals uh, instead of being, I would say, um, muddling through the technicalities. Um, do we have carrying costs that make sense considering the situation that we are in, are those costs aligned with the sort of risks we are taking? You know, you can directly ask those questions, forget, uh, forget the forecast, forget um, the seasonality, the way you model the seasonality, the way you factor the decreasing trend and whatnot and whatnot. So you have like dozens of, um, you know, artifacts that contribute to those calculations, but you can directly challenge the final outcome, which is I get dollars of outputs, you know, for those carrying costs, are they real? Do they make sense? Uh, or, 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 uh, and, and, uh, and the answer is that very frequently you can spot numbers that are downright nonsensical and fix them directly. Obviously, you want to avoid those situations, but um, don't operate under the assumption that in supply chain all the problems are incredibly subtle uh, um, uh, forecasting problems. Most of the times, the problems are brutal. There is uh, some kind of issues. The data has not been processed correctly. And then you get numbers that are completely nonsensical, such as negative margins or, um, or, 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 negative, carry or negative carrying costs that just you know, uh, wreak havoc in your supply chain. Now, uh, the what I would say is that if your supply chain instrumentation um, exclusively focuses on, let's say, demand forecasting accuracy, um, you are blind to 90% plus of the actual problems. And when I say 90%, I'm being very conservative. Um, in a large-scale supply chain, this estimate would probably be something like 99% plus. Um, supply chain instrumentation is absolutely fundamental to, uh, to highlight the key factors that contribute to the decisions. And those factors must be economic in nature if you want to have any hope to focus on what, uh, what makes your company profitable. Otherwise, you know, if you operate on percentages, um, you, you, can't, you can't prioritize your own actions. You will, you will, uh, you will address uh, glitches because, again, we are talking of a large-scale supply chain, so you always have like a legion of numerical glitches. And if you address all those glitches indifferently, um, then it means that you're always working on things that are largely inconsequential. That's why you miss to have like dollars of returns, dollars of costs. That's how you can actually prioritize your work, prioritize your, um, your development efforts for your numerical recipes, and even, even you know, decide whether a bug is worth fixing. There are some bugs where, I mean, if, we, if you're talking of a, a hand few dollars per year worth of friction, it's not even a bug that is worth fixing in practice. Now, let's get back to the matter of picking the right cutoff for the allocation list. Um, we have seen that we have roughly diminishing returns while allocating more um, stock to the store SKUs. Um, however, we must look at the whole supply chain, not just the stores, uh, the warehouse or distribution center. I'm using the two terms indifferently, uh, indifferently here, is dominated by fixed cost. Uh, indeed, it is possible to extend the staff of, uh, with temp workers, uh, but it tends to cost more. Plus, uh, it creates other problems, such as the temp workforce being typically less qualified than the permanent one. Um, thus, any warehouse or any DC has a target capacity where it operates at peak economic efficiency. The target capacity can be increased or decreased, but usually it involves adjusting the size of the permanent staff. Um, so it is a relatively slow process. You can expect you know, a warehouse to adjust its target capacity from, um, one, uh, from one quarter to the next, but you can't expect the warehouse to adjust its you know, 
its nominal capacity where it has peak efficiency from one day to the next. You know, it's a, it's, it, it, it cannot, it's not as di dynamic. Thus, we want to keep the warehouse operating at essentially peak efficiency or as close as possible to peak efficiency uh, all the time, unless we have um, an economic incentive that is strong enough to do otherwise. And the perspective of the prioritized stock allocation paves the way to do exactly that. Um, we can truncate the list by uh, making it a little um, shorter or longer and nudging the cutoff to keep it aligned with um, the target capacity of the warehouse. Um, and in practice, this comes with three major benefits. First, uh, smoothing the flow of the warehouse. By, by doing that, you keep the warehouse operating at, key, at peak capacity and uh, most of the time, and thus you save um, a lot of operating costs. The second, the, the second benefit is that your inventory allocation process becomes a lot more resilient to all the little accidents that keeps happening in a real world supply chain. Um, a truck May, may be get involved into a minor, track, uh, in, in minor traffic accident. Um, some staff may not show up because they are sick. Um, there are tons of small reasons that will you know, disrupt your plans. It will not prevent your warehouse to operate, but it might not operate exactly at the capacity you did anticipate. And, um, and with this prioritization list, you can make the most of uh, whatever capacity your warehouse happen to be using, not even if it's not exactly the capacity you were planning for in the first place. And, and, and third, the, the last third benefit is that with this, uh, with this approach of, of priority list of, uh, of stock allocation, your supply chain team doesn't have to micromanage the warehouse staff levels anymore. Um, you only need to adjust the target capacity of your warehouse so that it roughly match the sales velocity of your retail network. Indeed, um, uh, but micromanaging the capacity uh, at a daily level becomes completely inconsequential and or, or largely inconsequential. Indeed, the local experience indicate that smoothing the warehouse flow through um, through, I would say, uh, um, a flat capacity cutoff works well in most retail situations. Indeed, um, on the screen, you can see uh, the typical economic out, uh, return curve that you would observe when considering all the possible cutoff. So on the X axis, um, we have the uh, number of units being shipped from the warehouse. So we are conceptually assuming that units are shipped one by one so that we can observe the marginal contribution of every single unit. Naturally, in production, units are, sh are, are shipped in batches, not one by one, but this is just so that we can actually plot the curve. On the y-axis, we have the marginal economic outcomes uh, at the store level. So for the nth unit being shipped to a store, any store in the network. So the very first units uh, being allocated generate the bulk of the returns. Uh, indeed, in practice, the top of the list is uh, invariably consists of stuck out situations, uh, stuck out problems that, that demand immediate resolution. So that's why the first units, you're addressing your stuck outs, and that's why you have um, uh, economic returns that are very, very high. And then, uh, and then afterward, you, the returns dwindle. And um, we enter a flattish portion of the curve. Um, and this, area, this is the area that I refer to as the area of low economic sensitivity. Essentially, we are gradually pushing the service level closer to 100%, but we are not yet creating much dead stock. So, because essentially when you do this sort of prioritized allocation, what happens is that if we push you know, stock beyond addressing the stack out problems, we end up piling up first um, the stock on the fast movers. So it's essentially we create, um, we create stock in places that are not exactly needed right now. We will have opportunities in the future to replenish the stock without facing um, a, a problem of, of stock out in the meantime. But essentially, 
um, this is not the, the impact is minimal because essentially the stock will get sold. It will get sold relatively swiftly. And essentially, this is just about the opportunity cost of moving the stock from the distribution center to a store. And, and what we're losing gradually is are the later uh, opportunities to be able to move the stock. Once you, the stock is allocated, we, we lose uh, options, uh, future options. So, uh, uh, and so this, this area is essentially relatively flattish and it will start to become fairly negative when we push so much stock that we start generating situation that will cause, at least it is, um, uh, uh, that will cause inventory write-off with a non-trivial probability. So that's, that's where is that. A, if you keep pushing, then you generate more and more um, I would say dire overstock situation and thus what you see when the curve becomes very negative is that you see that if you push way too much you will generate essentially tons of inventory write-off in, uh, in the future. But essentially as long as the cutoff is in um, this low seg sensitive segment we're good and, um, and uh, we, the cutoff is not super sensitive to where you cut and that's the reason uh, where the warehouse capacity doesn't have to directly mimic the daily sales volume. And indeed, in uh, most retail networks, you have very strong day of the week, uh, we have a very strong day of the week cyclical pattern that you observe in your sales, where certain days, let's say for example, Saturday is um, the, the day where you're selling the most, uh, but um, the warehouse doesn't have to exactly mimic this um, day of the week cyclical patterns. You can keep a, a, a very flat average. And the reason um, and the idea is that your target capacity should just you know, roughly match the, the, uh, your overall sales volume for, the sa for your store network. If your target capacity is always a little bit below um, your overall sales volume uh, in the network, what will happen is that you will not be able to push enough. So you, you will first deplete all your stores gradually. Uh, and then face uh, a big problem. Or conversely, if you're pushing every single day, you're pushing a little more than what you're actually s selling, then very quickly you will completely saturate um, your stores. So as long as you, you, you keep it relatively balanced, but you don't need to micromanage with the day of the week pattern, it will work fine. And the reason why you don't need to micromanage you know, uh, inside with uh, fitting the day of the week pattern is just because it's actually the very first units that deliver the bulk of, um, of the returns. And you, you, the system, from an economic perspective, is not that sensitive as long as the cutoff remains roughly in this flattish segment. Now, I presented the stock reward function uh, for the sake of clarity and concision. Uh, we had much to cover in this lecture already. However, the stock reward function isn't the pinnacle of um, supply chain science. Um, the stock reward function is a bit naive when it comes to the fine print of probabilistic forecast. Um, back, in 2001, uh, uh, back in 2021, one of us at LOCAD, Gaetan de Letouin, uh, published the action reward function. The action reward function is um, the descendant, the spiritual descendant, if you wish, of the stock reward function. But this function comes with a uh, much more fine-grained perspective on the probabilistic forecasts themselves. Uh, indeed, all the probabilistic forecasts are not equal. Um, seasonality, varying lead times, uh, um, intake ETAs for the distribution centers are all taken into account in the action reward function while they were not taken into account with the stock reward function. Um, those, by the way, those capabilities also requires a more granular probabilistic forecast. So you need like a superior forecasting technology that is able to generate all those probabilistic forecasts to make, uh, to, to actually start using the stock reward function. In, uh, in this regard, the stock reward function is less demanding. Uh, and, um, and also at a conceptual level, the uh, action reward function also provides a clean decoupling uh, of the ordering frequency how frequently do you order from the supply lead time, which is how much time does it take to actually replenish the stock once the decision is taken. Um, those two elements were kind of lumped together in um, the stock reward function. With the action reward, they are clearly separated. 
And, um, and finally, uh, the action reward function also comes with um, uh, what is called, referred to as a, a decision ownership perspective, which is a simple but fairly clever trick to reap most of the benefits um, that would be gained from a, a true policy without having to introduce a policy. Um, so we will be discussing what policies are. This is uh, um, really mean from a really technical perspective in later lectures. But the bottom line is that as soon as you start introducing policies, it becomes more complicated. I mean, it is of interest, but it's definitely more complicated. So here the action reward has a clever trick where you can literally bypass the need to go for a policy and still reap most of the economic benefits that would be attached to it. So the, um, both the stock reward function and its superior alternative, the action reward functions, have been used um, in production for years at LOCAD. Um, those function essentially streamlines entire classes of issues that are uh, otherwise plaguing uh, retail networks. Uh, for example, dead stock becomes trivial to assess by just looking at the economic returns that is attached to any um, stock unit that is already present in any store. Uh, yet there are tons of angles that I have not addressed today. I will be addressing those aspects in later lectures. Some of those uh, angles can actually be addressed with uh, fairly minor variations of what I have presented today. Um, that is the case, for example, for um, lot multipliers and stock rebalancing. You, you need to do very, very little change to the scripts that I've just shown today to be able to tackle those problems. When I say stock rebalancing, I mean rebalance the stock between the store of the network, either by moving the stock back to the DC or by directly moving the stock, the, st uh, the stock between the stores, assuming obviously specific, you know, transportation cost. Um, then uh, there are some angles that requires more work, but they are still kind of relatively straightforward. That would be, for example, to take into account um, opportunity cost, uh, flat transportation cost, um, or the store intake over, um, I would say, overload, which happen when the staff of a store is just not capable of processing all the units they have received. They don't have the time on any given day to put them on the shelves, and thus it creates a big mess in the store. Um, so those angles, um, they are possible, but they will require definitively quite some work on top of what I have presented today. And then there are some other angles like, let's say, uh, merchandising or, you know, um, essentially working on improving the overall store attractiveness, which should be part of the prioritization, which do require um, a superior technological approach. Um, uh, minor variations of what I've presented today is just not enough. Um, as usual, I advise a healthy dose of skepticism uh, whenever an expert claims to have an optimal method. Uh, in supply chain, there is no such thing as optimal methods. We have tools. Some of them happen to be better, uh, but none of them is even remotely close to anything that would qualify as being optimal. And so, in conclusion, in conclusion, uh, percentages of error are irrelevant. Only dollars of error matter. Those dollars are driven by what your supply chain does at a physical level. Most KPIs are completely inconsequential. At best, they are part of the supply chain process to continuously improve the numerical recipes that you have, which are actually driving the supply chain decisions. However, even when considering such KPIs that are you know, uh, instrumental to improve the numerical recipes, we are talking at best of fairly indirect results compared to directly improve the numerical recipes that drive the decision and that will immediately, if you have a better recipe, generate better outcomes for your supply chain. Um, Excel sheets are ubiquitous in supply chain, and I believe this is because the mainstream supply chain theory uh, failed to promote decisions as first-class citizens. As a result, um, company waste time, money, and focus on um, second-class citizens, namely artifacts. And, um, but at the end of the day, decisions must be made. You know, stock must be allocated, you need to choose the price, your, sell, your, your price point, your tag price, etc. And lacking the proper support, supply chain practitioners fall, fall, fall back to the one tool that, uh, that they have, which let them directly treat decisions as first-class citizens. And this 
tool happen to be Excel spreadsheets. However, um, supply chain decisions can be treated as first class citizen. And this is exactly what we did today. And um, the tooling is not even that complex, uh, at least when considering the sort of ambient complexity uh, of the typical applicative landscape of a modern supply chain. Um, furthermore, an adequate tooling unlocks capabilities like smooth, smoothing the flow of inventory from um, distribution centers to the store uh, with minimal efforts. And those capabilities are straightforward to be achieved with the proper tooling, but they also illustrate the sort of, um, of achievement that cannot ever be uh, expected from Excel spreadsheets, at least not with a production grade setup. I guess this is it for today. Um, the next lecture will be uh, Wednesday, the 6th of July, at the same time of the day. So it will be 3 p.m., time of Paris. It will be a Wednesday, like today. And I will be moving on to the 7th chapter uh, to discuss the tactical execution of the quantity of a quantitative supply chain initiative. By the way, uh, I, I will be cycling back to um, the chapter 5, discussing probabilistic forecast, and chapter 6, uh, discussing decision-making techniques. In later lectures, uh, my goal is to basically do have um, a, a complete perspective on the, uh, uh, an entry-level perspective on all the elements before going really deep into any specific subject. So at this point, I will actually have a look at the questions. Sorry, I have a problem with my mouse that is not responding anymore. And here we are. So, okay. By the way, do we still have the screen? Yeah, okay, very good. Um, so, we have a first question from uh, Jesus Christ. I guess I have quite an audience today. Uh, the Z fund could have infinite possibilities. Wouldn't all the solution be short term in that case. Um, so the Z-Funk is literally a data container for a sequence of options. So the sort of horizon that is applicable is uh, embedded into the sort of alpha value, you know, the, the time discount values that I've used uh, in, in my scripts. So fundamentally, um, the sort of target time horizon that you have embedded into the economic outcome of a Z-Funk is not really into the Z-Funk themselves. They are more into the sort of economic calculation that are filling in the Z-Funk. Don't forget that the Z-Funks are just the data containers. Uh, so that, that, that's what makes it you know, short term or long term. And obviously, um, you want to adjust your numerical recipes so that that represents your priorities. For example, if your, your company has, uh, I, I would say, is under a massive amount of stress due to cash flows uh, problems, you will probably put, you know, to have a much more short-termish perspective on having, um, uh, in, I would say, intake of money. So basically just liquidating your, your inventory. If you're very rich in cash, maybe you prefer to delay the sales um, to, uh, to a later period, but uh, selling at a better price and ensuring a better uh, gross margin. So again, all of those things are possible with Z-Funks. Z-Funks are just containers. They don't necessarily presuppose any kind of numerical recipe for the economic outcomes that you want to put in the Z-Funks. Uh, a second question from uh, Moses uh, Ose, uh, uh, Oxe Sola. I'm very sorry if I just pronounce it uh, for my terrible pronunciations of those names. I think that most assumptions must be based on existing real values of the uh, objective functions. Don't you think? Um, okay, most assumptions must be based on existing real values of the objective functions. Um, what is real? You see, that's, that's the that, that was mostly the problem that I discussed in, um, in the lecture, experimental optimization. You see, the problem is that whenever you say you have values or measurements or stuff, what you have is mathematical constructs, numerical constructs. It's not because it's numerical that it's correct. You see, it's only, um, you see, the way I approach a supply chain, it's an experimental science. You have to connect to the real world. That's how you 
decide if it's real or not. And thus, the question is, uh, and, and I, I completely agree, uh, here is that assumption must be based not on, on I would say, exist pre-existing real values, because there is no such thing as pre-existing real values. It must be checked, those assumptions must be checked and must be challenged against um, the sort of real world observation that you can make on your supply chain. You see, uh, the correctness uh, of your assumption is, um, can only be obtained, you know, assessed through the contact with the reality of the reality of your supply chain. And that is where this experimental optimization perspective is tricky because the mathematical optimization perspective just assume that all the variables are known, how all the variables are real, all the variables can be observed, and that the loss function can be, you know, just is correct. But um, the point that I'm making is that a supply chain is like a super complex system. It's not true. Most of the thing, um, it, at best, what you have is fairly indirect measurements. I mean, first, when I say stock level, I don't actually go into the store to actually check if the stock level is correct. What I have is a very indirect measurement that is an electronic record uh, that I've obtained from an enterprise um, software system that was typically put in place two decades ago for reasons that had nothing to do with doing data science in the first place. So that's what I'm saying is that the problem with reality is that um, a supply chain is always geographically distributed. So everything that you measure, everything that you see in terms of values are indirect measurements and thus in a way, they are never, I mean, the reality of this measurement is always under question. You know, there is not such thing as like a direct observation or, I mean, you can do a direct observation just to do a, a control or a check, but it cannot be anything but a tiny, tiny percentage of all the values that you need to manipulate for your supply chain. Uh, apparently, we had lost the uh, the question screen. So um, another question from uh, Chris Peterson: In the stock reward functions, uh, besides straightforward parameters like margin, we are also dealing with stock out penalty. How do we learn? Uh, uh, how do we best learn to optimize these complex parameters? Um, this is a very very good question. Uh, indeed, stock out penalty are real. I mean, otherwise, nobody would even bother to have, you know, high service levels. The, 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 the reason why you, you want to have service level is that, economically speaking, uh, every retailer that I know of is convinced that stock out penalties are real, that basically customers dislike not, uh, uh, ha I would say, suffering a low quality of service. Uh, but I would not say that they are complex in the sense it's not like there is many, many variables. I would say they are complicated. They are, they are just intrinsically difficult. And, and part of their difficulty is that it's literally the long-term strategy of um, the retail network that is at stake. You know, this is literally a number um, uh, with most of my clients, for example, the stockout penalty is something that I discuss directly with the CEO of the company. It's, it literally gets to the very top. This is literally the super long-term strategy of the retail network that is at stake. So it's not that complex, but it is definitely complicated because it is a very high stake discussion. What is it that we want to do? What is it, uh, how do we want to treat the customers? Do we want to say we have the very, very best prices and sorry if the quality of service is not, you know, uh, not as good as you, as you can get, but what you have is something a bit unique with very, very low prices or um, do you want to have novelty? But if you have novelty, it means that there are new products that comes in. And if you have new products that comes in all the time, it means that the old products are fading out. And thus, it means that you should tolerate that stock out happens because that's how you keep introducing novelty. Uh, so you see, the, the, stock out, uh, the, the, the stock out penalty is, um, is, is difficult to assess because it directly, it has enormous stakes in the long-term strategy of the company. And then um, I would say in practice, the best way to actually assess it is to do literally experiments. You pick a value a bit, you know, you guesstimate something, and then you look at the sort of resulting inventory decisions that you get. So you see, you, that's why I say you need to have a tooling that lets you experiments with plenty of variance of your numerical recipes. You just pick a bit at random. It's like a, a rough guesstimation. 
the uh, stock out penalty value, uh, the stock penalty factor. And then you look at what sort of stocks do you get in your stores. And then you let people with their feelings judge, is, does it look like the sort of stock level that I would, that would reflect my ideal store? You know, is it, is it what I really want for my customers? Is it what I really want to achieve with my retail network? So you see, there, and, and there is this discussion with back and forth. Typically, the supply chain scientist is going to test a series of values, present you know, the sort of economic outcomes. Um, the, also, the role of the supply chain scientist will be to explain the sort of um, macro costs that are attached to a driver. So you say they could see, OK, we can put a very large a stock out penalty. But beware, if we do that, it means that uh, our stock allocation logic is going to all the time be pushing tons of stock towards the stores. Because if we say, if the message is stock outs are deadly, then it means that you know, we, we, should, we should really do everything that we can to prevent those from happening. So, that's, so essentially, we need to have this, this discussion with sort of a lot of iteration so that the, 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 the management can check, I would say to do the, the sort of reality check is, is my long-term strategy economically viable with regard to what, um, what my retail network can actually do. And, uh, and that's how you essentially gradually converge. But by the way, it is also not something that is frozen in stone. Uh, companies change, adjust their strategy over time. So it's not because you take a stock out penalty factor in 2010 that tw 2022, it has to be the same value, especially if, for example, uh, especially, for example, with the rise of e-commerce, for example, uh, uh, re there are many retail networks that just say, well, I, am much, I have become much more tolerant to, uh, um, to basically stock out in my stores, depends especially for, speci uh, for, for specialized stores, because essentially when a product is missing, especially a variant in terms of size, well, people will just order it uh, online from the e-commerce. The, the store becomes like a showroom. Um, so the quality of the s of service of showroom becomes very different from what was expected when the store was literally the only way to sell the products. Another question from Moses uh, OK Sola: Can we have a compounded stock reward function to correctly understand the trend within a given period? Um, so understanding the trend. So understanding the trend of what exactly? If it's a trend of the demand. Um, the stock reward is a function that consumes uh, a probabilistic forecast. So whatever trend you have into the demand, it's typically a factor of your, the way you model your demand. And so um, as far as the stock reward function is concerned, um, the, the, the probabilistic forecast already embeds all of that. You know, whether there is a trend or not, it's already that. Um, now, if you have another question, which is, uh, it, it might be another question with, the sort of stationary perspective of um, the stock reward. And, and here, you're completely correct. The stock reward function has a completely stationary perspective. So basically, it assumes that the demand is repeat itself probabilistically at every period exactly the same. So there is no trend, no cyclicity. Uh, it is a purely stationary perspective. So you're correct in this, in this sort of situation. And the answer is no. The stock reward function is not able to deal with a non-stationary demand. However, the action reward function is capable of doing that. That was also one of the motivation to transition toward the, the uh, action reward function, is that with the action reward function, you can deal with non-stationary probabilistic um, uh, demand. So um, Manuel Pereira Lopez. Uh, we are assuming that warehouse capacity is fixed, but it depends on the picking, packing, and shipping effort. Shouldn't the cutoff list points be defined by the optimization of the warehouse operations? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, you see, that's what I was said when essentially you have this, this zone of low economic sensitivity. So you know that your, uh, your, your, your priority list that represents the prioritized stock allocation isn't super sensitive with regard to where you cut as long as it's within this segment. You know? and, and then on average, you should be really balanced in terms of how much you push and how much you sell, which just makes sense. So now, if you want to adjust 
uh, slightly differently the cutoff uh, after you run the, I would say, the warehouse optimization logic because you have to take into account of all the picking, packing, and shipping efforts, and you have, you know, variations, it's fine. You, you can have, like, literally last minute variation, uh, and, uh, and that's the beauty of this prioritized um, uh, stock allocation list is that you can literally finalize the exact scope of the units being shipped at the last minute. You know, the, la the only operation that you need is just an aggregation. It can be done very, very swiftly. And thus, it gives you more options. That's exactly what I said when I said that this approach opens new classes of supply chain optimization. It lets you, for example, decide just in time to, re to rearrange your picking, packing, and shipping efforts instead of being rigidly stuck to a preordained, uh, uh, I would say, shipping envelope uh, that don't, doesn't really match the exact resources that you have and the exact sort of um, effort that it takes to execute this envelope. And, um, and now the, uh, another question from uh, Moses uh, okay, Sola. Smoothing warehouse flows demands a smoothing pr production flow. Does this uh, decision model consider that? Um, I would say it does not require necessarily a smoothing production flow. First, um, the situation for many retail networks, let's say um, general merchandise stores, is that essentially you, um, the, the retail network, if that's the case for general merchandise store, they are ordering from large FMCG companies who are producing very, very big batches on their side. And so uh, fundamentally, um, you don't need to. You may wish to. Uh, that's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you may, you, it may be of interest to smooth the production flow. The, my, the point that I'm making is that you don't need to produce a, uh, the, uh, the uh, production uh, flow in order to save, to generate benefits uh, in terms of operating costs from the distribution center. So even if the production has not been smooth, you already have benefits in just smoothing uh, essentially the shipments from the distribution center to the stores. Then you're, ab uh, you're absolutely correct if you happen to be a vertically integrated, a vertically integrated um, brand that has internalized its production facilities, its distribution centers, and its stores, um, then indeed you have, uh, uh, there is a vivid interest to do basically a supply chain-wide optimization and to smooth the entire flow. You're completely correct. And so this approach uh, um, uh, of, I would say, net network-wide optimization is again uh, very much aligned with um, the spirit of what I've presented today. However, um, if I look at the techniques that I've presented today, I've, I've presented a series of angles. Um, if, you, if you really want to optimize, I would say, a, a true multi-echelon uh, um, supply chain network, you will need a technique that is, I would say, a considerable, that is, that is different from what I've presented today. There are many things that are building blocks uh, that will let you do that, but you can't just tweak the scripts that I've presented today to, 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 to do that. You, uh, again, this, this would fall into the class of, you need a superior technology to do that. Um, um, this will be the sort of technology where we cover the multi-echelon setup will be presented in later lecture. This is, um, this is more complicated. Um, and uh, another question, and that might actually be the last question, uh, from Chris Peterson. Um, the stock reward approach and um, uh, the expected ROI reminds me of the well-known expected value concept from finance. From your point of view, why is this approach not mainstream in supply chain circle yet? Um, you are completely correct, Chris. Um, this, those things, um, the, um, these sort of things, have been done, I would say, um, uh, oh, by the way, my team tells me that there are more questions. Uh, no problem. Uh, so um, those sort of things, you know, a, a true economic analysis of the outcomes has been done for ages in, uh, in financial circles. Uh, I, I believe that most banks are doing this sort of calculation since essentially the 80s. And probably people were doing them even before with pen and paper. Um, so. Yes, it is, it is something that has, been, that has been done for ages in other verticals. Um, I believe the, 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 the problem with, uh, with supply chain was that until 
until essentially the advent of the internet, supply chains are geographically distributed. You know, that is by nature. You have bio stores, you have distribution centers, etc. It's distributed um, geographically. And before essentially, let's say 1995, it was possible but very complicated to move data uh, across the internet for companies. You know, it, it was feasible, but doing it reliably, cheaply, uh, and, and have, I would say, enterprise system that lets you consolidate all of that. Um, there were very, very few, there were very, very few companies around who had those sort of capabilities. So essentially, um, I would say that supply chains got digitalized very, very early on. Let's say as soon as essentially the 80s, um, you had like digital point of sale uh, in the 80s. Th this was not even new. Um, but they were not, I would say, heavily networked. So, uh, so this, I would say, the, the networking ingredient and all the plumbing, it came relatively late, I would say, after year 2000 for most companies. And, and so the problem was that Imagine you are operating in a, in a distribution center, but you're fairly isolated from the rest of the network. So it, it was just that the, the, the warehouse manager didn't have the resources to do this sort of fancy numerical calculation. The warehouse manager had already a warehouse to manage. Uh, this person was typically not an analyst. And so essentially those sort of practices that were, that were that are predating the age of the internet where all the information is available uh, across the network have persisted. That would be you know, my, the reason, and, and by the way, supply chains are typically very large, complicated, and complex beasts, and thus they move slowly. So let's say you know, having the data shared across the network with very nice data lakes, let's say it was 2010, though that, that was 10 years ago. Uh, well, what I observe is that some companies are moving now, some have already moved, but, uh, but ten, a decade is not that long considering you know, very, very large um, supply chains. And that's why it remains, you know, that's why while it, those sort of analysis have been, I would say, the default in finance for like four decades, um, they are still only emerging nowadays in, in supply chain, or at least that's my humble opinion on the case. Another question from uh, Manuel Pera Lopez. What about stockout cost mainly calculated on misplacement cost? Um, you can do that. Again, you see, the stockout cost is literally a decision that you take. It is literally your um, strategic perspective that you have on, uh, on the sort of service that you want your retail network to deliver to your clients. So it's literally, there is no base reality. It's literally whatever you want. Uh, but uh, the question where I'm not too sure about the misplacement cost is that the reality is that um, typically um, most retail networks only survive because they have lo a loyal customer base. So pe people, if they don't buy once and never come back, they do come back, you know, if it's like a, a general merchandise store, people come back every week. If it's like a fashion store, they will maybe come back every quarter. If it's like a furniture store, people will come back every two years, but they will come back. And so uh, the, usually the problem of the quality of service is really something that is very long term, which is making sure that your clients have a good positive experience of your store so that they remain loyal to your brand. Um, so, and typically this sort of uh, cost of loss of loyalty are, I would say for most, most stores, dwarfing, um, I would say, uh, misplacement costs. The only sort of exceptions are um, the stores. I mean, there are plenty of exceptions, but the, the one that comes to my mind are retail stores that have a brand where they really want to be the cheapest of the cheapest. So here, essentially, they would say, we, are, we, we, we sacrifice everything, assortment, quality of service, but whatever you can find in this store is going to be the cheapest of the cheapest, and you will never be able to find the same stuff at a lower price. So that would be, you know, sort of strategy where you would say, okay, um, the stockout cost is just the misplacement cost and this is it. Um, that's fine. But you see, this is um, usually the long-term impact on customer loyalty is dwarfing this sort of cost. And another question from um, Jesus Christ, uh, what is the goal of stocking your warehouse, keeping it supplied to serve your customers, low prices, or supplying your warehouses to keep your stores supplied with products with higher prices. 
So the, 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 this is a very good question. Why do you keep any stock at all in the distribution center? You know, why have any stock at all in the distribution center? Why not cross dock everything directly uh, sending everything to the stores? So the answer is there are retail networks that literally cross dock everything. But even when you cross dock everything, it means that essentially you're passing orders to your supplier. Maybe, you know, day one, you pass order to the supplier. Day three, you are being delivered certain amount of quantities. The question is, you order those quantities with a specific uh, allocation scheme in mind. So you, you order certain quantities thinking that you were about to push those units towards certain stores. The question is, why should you not change your mind? Because now, you know, the, 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 the stock is, um, is, is being delivered. It's available, you know, on the cross dock in, the, in uh, the distribution center. You're free to reallocate as you wish those units. You know, you, you don't have to be rigidly attached to the sort of allocation scheme that you had in mind two days ago. So essentially, you can decide to not keep the, uh, the stock in the, in the DC, just do cross dock, but because there will be a delay between when you pass your orders with your suppliers to when you actually dispatch the stock to the stores, you can you know, change your mind and redo a slightly different dispatch just because you might have you know, good surprise such as stockouts. I mean, stockouts is always kind of a good surprise because it means that there was like a surge of demand that you didn't expect. Yes, you would prefer not to have a stockout, but on the plus side, it means that there was you know, an excess of demand compared to what you were expecting. So it's not that bad. Um, and so, so that would be, and then uh, what about the other situation? Why should you even keep stock in uh, the warehouse? Well, the answer is typically for most, um, uh, for, for, for many retail network, um, you have ordering constraints for your suppliers. You know, FMCG companies might say, we don't let you pass an order every single day. You, you can order only a sing, uh, one, one day per week. So you can do a weekly order that will be a batch and typically the supplier wants to deliver a full truck to your distribution center. So, so the, your orders will be fairly bulky and batched. And now, um, so you will have, and now every single day you will deliver stock to your stores, but essentially your distribution center is just a buffer for those batches that represent the deliveries um, that are being made to your DC. And, um, and there might be you know, other reasons why you want to keep, um, to keep it in stock. Um, remember that as long as the stock is in the distribution center, you still have the option to change your mind where the stock should actually land in which store. So as long as it's in the distribution center, you can change your mind. As soon as the stock is allocated into a specific store, most of the time, for most retail network, not for ha hard luxury, but for most retail networks, um, uh, the, the transportation cost of bringing the stock back to the warehouse is, is, is very expensive and it's the sort of things that you don't want to do. Okay, so thank you very much. And, uh, and I guess I will see you next time. We will see how we can do a tactical execution and start an actual quantitative supply chain initiative in a real world company. See you next time.